This is the uh, fifth in a series of messages called Beginnings, taken from the book of uh, Genesis. Uh, the first 11 chapters of Genesis just kind of naturally generate questions, so I'll take questions at the end of the message, so if you think of something while I'm talking, make a note of it. Uh, Genesis portrays in just a few strokes some of the most important questions of life. Where did the world come from? How did we get here? What is our purpose? Why is the world in such a mess? Is there any hope for this world? Uh, Genesis begins, in the beginning God. It says God was the beginning of all that we know. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The world didn't come together by chance. The universe hasn't always existed. God created it. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Mankind was created by God. God breathed into every human being in this earth uh, his life and his spirit. Uh, our spiritual history runs from innocence to disobedience and on into moral decline. And there's nothing the world can do to arrest that. Now today we come to Genesis chapter 4. Turn in your Bible to the fourth chapter of Genesis. Beginning of the Bible. We have Bibles under the seats. We read, Adam made love to his wife Eve and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. So Cain was a farmer and Abel was a shepherd. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. Uh, Cain brought some of his fruit, a sampling, apparently not necessarily his best. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. Abel brought the best of his flock. He brought organic USDA prime. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Now why did God look with favor on Abel's gift but not on Cain's. It appears that while Abel brought the pick of his flock, his herd, uh, Cain was arrogant and just brought any old sampling he could find. Maybe a few pieces of fruit had dropped on the ground, he just gathered them up quickly and brought them. He didn't give out of love, but out of duty. This tells us something very important about us when we come to worship. If we come to worship God and we don't bring our heart, we don't come with love, we don't uh, worship with passion, we don't have tears, then chances are pretty good God will not be pleased. Now, if you're reading something in the Old Testament and you say, I don't really fully get this, this Cain and Abel, what can you do? Well, you can just type into your phone, give me all references in the Bible on Cain and Abel. So we find that John, one of Jesus' disciples, speaks about Cain. Do not be like Cain. And remember now, the New Testament writers, like the Old Testament, were inspired by God. So this is God's inspiration helping us understand Genesis 4. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. John says Cain's intentions were not good. He didn't come with the right attitude. He didn't bring the best. And then in Hebrews 11 we read, By faith Abel brought a better offering than Cain did. By faith he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith Abel still speaks even though he is dead. So by faith, Abel brought the best of his flocks and herds. Now back to Genesis 4, verse 6. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? 
Uh, Cain's response is twofold. One, he's exceedingly angry. And two, his face is downcast. His face gives him away. Verse 7, if you do what is right, God says, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Uh, last week we learned that when Adam and Eve sinned, disobeyed God, sin entered the world. Now we're going to see sin spread. God gives Cain a gracious warning not to let his anger control him, knowing he stands on the verge of a grievous sin. Cain should have displayed sorrow for bringing a careless gift rather than anger toward God who graciously warned him. Uh, when God tells Cain that he should uh, rule over the anger, the emotion that's welling up within him, he doesn't mean that we can master uh, ourselves on our own strength, but we're always to depend on God. And with his help, we can have victory over sin. Verse 8, now Cain said to his brother Abel, Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Uh, Cain invites Abel to go out in the countryside with him where nobody can see them. This tells us that his act is premeditated. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? Uh, God's question matches his question he brought to Adam and Eve. Where are you in the garden? When God asks a question, he's not looking for information. God is omniscient. He knows everything. He knows exactly where Abel is. He's letting Cain know that he knows where Abel is. Cain answers, nope, don't know where he is, no idea. I mean, what do, you, what do you expect? Do you expect me to watch out for my little brother all the time? Am I my brother's keeper? He's snarky and salty. His heart is hardening. He's not humble like Adam and Eve when God caught them in sin. The answer to Cain's question and the point of the passage is yes, we are our brother's keeper because we are all created in the image of God. Whether you're a teenager or senior citizen, single or married, you have to know that you are your brother's keeper. Verse 10, the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. All humans are made in God's image. And so God is saying, when a life has been shed, the blood cries out to me from the ground. There's a, there's a cry for justice to be done. We find the same thing at the end of the Bible. Revelation 6, verse 9. This is also written by John, Jesus' disciple. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw on the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God. These were martyrs. And the testimony they had maintained. They had called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? When will justice be done, God? There's a natural cry in all of us for wrongs to be righted. Back to Genesis 4, verse 11. God says to Cain, Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You'll be restless wanderer on the earth. You say, this is why I don't believe in God. He's so cruel. Who would want to follow a God like that? Actually, the punishment is pretty reasonable. Abel is made in the image of God when his blood is shed it seeps into the ground, and now the ground will not give forth its fruit to Cain's labor. Instead, he'll become a wanderer throughout the earth. Verse 13, Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. This is too much, God. Today you're driving me from the land, and I'll be hidden from your presence. I'll be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. It seems clear 
that Adam and Eve have had other children by this time and they'll have more to come that will grow to maturity and Cain is worried that some of them will want to avenge their brother Abel's blood. Notice he's only concerned about himself. He doesn't appear to be uh, feel bad about what he's done. He's just sorry that he got caught. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Node, east of Eden. So God promises to graciously protect him. So why did God preserve this account in his word? What are we to take from this horrendous act of bloodshed? You could probably mention several things, but I find three. One, we are our brother's keeper because we are all created in the image of God. When Cain asks, am I my brother's keeper? The clear answer is yes. We are all created in the image of God. We are all of intimate value. So yes, we are to take care of each other. When Jesus is asked what's the greatest commandment, he answers, the most important one is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than than these. We're all to, we're to love our, our neighbor because we're all created in the image of God. Everyone matters. God has placed his law on every heart living in this world that we're created in God's image and so we're to take care of each other. We're to show compassion. There are three worldviews that are vying for the future of this world. Christianity, Islam, and atheism. Our Western culture is secular. So it's widely believed that moral values are socially constructed rather than God-given. As it's commonly uh, asserted, no one is allowed to tell anyone else what's right or wrong. Each one of us has to figure that out for ourselves. It's a cultural given that we each establish our own moral values. Nevertheless, it's just as strongly believed that all people are obligated to support equal rights, justice for all, and care for the poor. This is one of the greatest contradictions in our society. It insists that all morality is relative, and then it demands moral behavior. If someone asks, why should I sacrifice my time and money for somebody else who is starving? Why should I give a rip about somebody else? Why should I be unselfish? The culture can manage only two answers, and both are inadequate. The first answer is that to do so serves our own self-interest. That's like an oxymoron. You, you do self-sacrificial behavior if, if, if in your self-interest? The second answer is that these values are simply self-evident. But for many, they're not. It's not self-evident from Darwinian naturalism, from secular atheism that we ought to care for other people. These modern beliefs that we should be all be committed to equal rights and justice, but that there are no God-given moral absolutes, undermine each other. Modern secular education teaches that every child must be true to themselves. They must find their deepest desires and dreams and pursue them all out, not being stopped by tradition or family or religion. Then it calls for justice, reconciliation, and benevolence. All of which are basic forms of self-denial. Even as it encourages self-assertion. It teaches relativism and calls people to be ethical. It encourages self-seeking and calls people to be self-sacrificial. It's like surgically, surgically removing an organ and then demanding function. 
It's like castrating horses and then bidding the geldings to be fruitful. It's a contradiction. Charles Taylor, in his book, Sources of the Self, The Making of the Modern Identity, writes, Modern society is on the deepest level incoherent. With regard to morality, our culture demands impartial benevolence toward all people, social justice for every oppressed class, and the reduction of hunger, disease, and suffering everywhere in the world, while denying that any moral value is anything other than arbitrary, subjective preference. Sialaba, himself an atheist, doing a review on this book, uh, tells us that Taylor's thesis makes him very uncomfortable. He writes, Perseverance in vir virtue will require self-sacrifice. And self-sacrifice seems to require some transcendental justification or motivation, of which the most common and perhaps the most logical is belief in the existence of God, or so Taylor argues. Since modern freedom entails the rejection of transcendence, God, um, modern virtue is wholly contingent. Can we be good for long without God? Taylor's doubts are daunting. When we reject God and moral absolutes, as secularism, atheism does, we lose the foundation for asking people to be committed to equal rights. And justice. The most compelling justification for pursuing justice for all and compassion for other people is what Genesis tells us that we are all created in God's image. We are of infinite value. The best example of showing compassion for other people is in Jesus coming and dying for our sins. Drawing on his example gives us all the motivation we need to be our brother's keeper. The second thing I find is when we seek God's forgiveness, we are to live lives worthy of repentance. One of the striking things about this account is that Cain seems to show no remorse. There's no sign of him being guilty. He's just sorry that he got caught. Throughout the Bible, whenever we're confronted with our sin, the response God calls for is to us to admit it, confess it, and repent of it, and then follow God. Get back on the path to doing what God wants us to do. Uh, when I was in college and in seminary, for four summers, I led the youth, uh, summer youth program at Valley Community Presbyterian Church. It's about... I don't know, two and a half miles from here. And uh, I led the Young Life Club at Beaverton High School, and one of the kids who attended was, uh, her father was the pastor of Valley Community, and she said, you got to hire Ron. And so he did. And so the very first summer, I scheduled a water ski trip. What a surprise that I would do that. And uh, we went to Merwin Dam by Mount St. Helens, and... Uh, we skied all morning, we had lunch, and I gave a talk, and then we skied all afternoon. Well, toward the end of the day, it was my turn to ski, and uh, it was a nice day. This is like July 1st, it was 80 degrees, and, uh, but the water was like 58, you know, all the snow melt from Mount St. Helens, and so I didn't want to get wet, so I decided I would do a beach start. So I put my ski on, and I I just stand on the you know on the beach or you know a, a foot you know into the water, and and say hit it. So we did that, and up I went. I wasn't going to get wet above my knees, and everything was great. Uh, but I couldn't get my back foot in in uh in in the in the boot, and so I fell. Oh my goodness! When I fell and I went into that water, I thought, oh, this is so cold. Now, I've never had a problem with swearing. <laughs> I've never had a filthy tongue. I have a lot of sins. I got a lot of shortcomings. But that has never been one of them. But I'll tell you, when I came out of that water, just spontaneously, this four-letter word at the top of my lungs came out. It starts with an S. 
and all the mothers and fathers sitting on the beach and all the kids and all the leaders they're thinking, do we really want to entrust our kids, our precious 14, 15, 16 year olds to this guy? I said, oh God, I'm sorry. Help me not do that again. One of the books I read this summer was Rosario Champagne Butterfield's The Secrets of an Unlikely Convert. At 36 years old, she was the youngest female tenured professor in the United States at Syracuse University. She was an avowed lesbian, radical, uh, taught radical feminist studies. Uh, she was a leader in the movement, speaker around the country, writer. She was very well known. She had a blog and a pastor in Syracuse responded uh, and uh, they began a dialogue back and forth and after a while he invited her over to uh, his house for dinner, he and his wife and and she, she tells us in her book, she says, you know, I'd never been in a Christian's home before, let alone for dinner. I had no idea what was going to happen. And, but they had a good time. They, she said, they didn't invite me to church. She said, if they had, I probably would have been out of there. Uh, they did, we just talked. And over the course of a year, through emails and more dinners, she gave her life to Christ. Well, it was uh, fall term. And now she was a Christian, how was she going to approach her classes? She had 200 uh, students signed up for her introduction to women's studies. She had a feminist ped pedagogy class. How would she teach them now as a Christian? And she was allowed to uh, uh, put any class uh, she wanted, and so she uh, put, put a class in called Christian Hermeneutics. Would anybody attend? So each day, she said, it brought to her a deluge of moral choices. She says, one good thing about that fall is, for the first time in two years, I no longer had anxieties and nightmares. She used to just have horrible nights. She cleaned out her house. She got rid of things that she didn't think were honoring to God. She said she got rid of whole libraries of books. She attempted to live a life worthy of her repentance. And the third thing I find is the overarching theme of the Bible is that God is gracious. God was gracious with Cain. Verse 6, Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. God is giving Cain there a warning. Watch out with your anger. And then after Cain kills his brother, the Lord said to him, uh, and he's worried that you know, one of uh, his brothers or sisters is going to kill him. Not so. Anyone who kills Satan, a Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. The Lord God put a mark on Cain that so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Node, east of Eden. Uh, God showed Cain grace by sparing his life. The rule in Revelation in, in Genesis nine verse six is whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. Why? For in the image of God has God made mankind. We are all made in God's image. and it, We are so valuable that if someone sheds someone's life, then they give their life. That's the standard. So why doesn't God do that with Cain? Because he's gracious. Two of my favorite verses are Lamentation 3, 22 and 23. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So Barb, come on up here. Uh, this is Barb Samuels. Barb, uh, I met her six months ago when she started attending our church. And uh, um, 
she comes to the prayer group on uh, Wednesday morning. So when you put a prayer request in, she's one of the people that's uh, praying for your request. And just somehow on one Wednesday, uh, you, you shared that you'd nearly lost your life five times. And you're wondering, God spared me five times. Why? What, what does he want me to do? And I said, Barb, you got to share that story. And so here you go. You're terrified, aren't you? Not so much as I was. Uh, uh, last nine o'clock, really bad, huh? Yeah, really yeah. well. <laughs> you got to watch him because he knows all the questions they ask, and the truth will come out. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, I had, before I tell my story, I have to tell you that this is my story, and that there are other stories out there, probably worse than mine. But uh, this is just how I uh, came to realize. Uh, and maybe you've asked yourself the same question. What am I doing here? What am I supposed to do? So uh, I'll get into it now. <clears throat> First of all, I was born into a Christian family, number three of four girls, no brothers to tease, so that was okay with me. But my parents, especially my mother, was very strict and uh, she believed that you went to church and Sunday school every Sunday, no excuses, no matter how you felt. You just got in the car, didn't grumble, and you went. That's right. <laughs> so so uh, I did that throughout my childhood, but, but then in my teens, something happened, you know how it is with teenagers, and I rebelled, and one summer I was out swimming with my friends, and I happened to met, meet this young man who uh, was tall, dark, and handsome, and very persuasive in speech, and uh, I thought, oh, this is Mr. Right, I hit the jackpot. So uh, eventually we eloped, and uh, soon after that I found out that he wasn't Mr. Right, he was definitely Mr. Wrong, but we were married, so it was during that time that I had the five experiences that Ron has briefly told you about, and this is a story of my life, but I will be brief and concise, I only take about five minutes, so bear with me. So the first time I had this experience was uh, uh, my husband and I were in the basement of our house and <clears throat> uh, I said something, I don't even know what I said, but it set him off, he got angry at me and the next thing I knew, I was on the floor of the basement and with he had his uh, hands around my neck and he was choking me. And uh, I just immediately went to prayer and then all at once he stopped. And so I just got up and I left, and that was the end of that. Uh, the second time, uh, we, it was in the evening, and we were at home, and the phone rang, and I answered it, and it was a wrong number. Well, my husband got it into his head that that was my lover, and I was being unfaithful to him. So he immediately went and got his gun and had me sit in the chair. And we sat there with that gun and pointed at my head uh, till dawn broke in the morning. And I prayed during that time. And, and uh, finally that too ended and he walked away from me. The third time, uh, he uh, said, I want to take you out to this house to see if you'd like to live, but it's way out in the country. Do you want to go? So I said, sure, you know, why not? So we got in the car and we drove out miles away from anything. I mean, and there was this broken down house in the middle of a field just sitting there. It didn't look like anybody could live in it at all, but I went with him. He took me inside and he show, started showing me around and uh, we got in this one room and uh, I started to get the feeling, you know, how you, the neck on the hair on your neck starts to stand up, and and uh, I looked around over my shoulder, and there he was, and I didn't know how he got there so quick, but he was right behind me, and I looked in his eyes, and they were dark, and and I I just knew fear right then and there, and I knew I had to get out of there, uh, so I hurriedly uh, uh, walked out of the room, down the stairs, out the door, and into the car, and I'm just praying the whole time that God get me through this and other time so uh, I made it through that uh, time and then uh, the fourth time uh, I was experiencing a difficult childbirth and I had gone into uh, the delivery room to deliver this child and uh, the next thing I knew I was 
found myself walking through this very dark tunnel and I could hear a voice saying just go to the end go to the end go to the end it kept repeating that over and over and over again and it was dark and I didn't know what to expect I was afraid but then then I blacked out and the next thing I remember I was in a, a hospital room and in hospital bed and I could hardly speak and and I was very weak and I saw my uh, mother my father and my husband were all there and that's when they told me that uh, the baby had been born but he was born deformed and uh, during the time that I was unconscious they had already taken him out and gotten rid of him and they said they want didn't want me to see him because they felt that in the condition I was in it would be such a shock to my system that I, I wouldn't make it so and then the doctor also told me do not get pregnant for the next 10 years or if you do you will surely die okay and the fifth time uh, I contracted somehow don't know how uh, a, a rare disease is called Gilliam Barre and I don't know if any of you have ever heard of that or not but it's, it can be fatal if not treated in time so I couldn't walk I just kind of shuffled along and if I sat in the chair I didn't have enough muscle to stand up myself and get out of the chair so I saw the doctor and he gave me some medicine and it was after a few days I realized that the medicine wasn't working I was getting worse uh, so I called the doctor back and he says uh, take an ambulance and go to the nearest regional hospital it was a bigger hospital than our local one so they can treat you there so I refused to take an ambulance so I made my husband get in the car and drive me to the hospital and where I was examined and through the examination they told me well you know we don't have any beds in the hospital uh, we're full up we don't have a room to put you in so they put me in a holding room which was next to the emergency room door and it was very uh, cold and drafting in there every time the uh, automatic door opened I would get a cold breeze of air so I spent a rather fitful night uh, not knowing what to expect and I was alone because uh, my husband left as soon as they took me in he left and I was you know by, left by myself so uh, in the morning finally the morning came and the nurse came into my room and I was so glad to see somebody I said oh good morning and she went like that like she was scared I shocked her and I apologized to her and I said well I didn't mean to scare you and she says no no it's not that it's just that we didn't expect you to make it through the night so I don't know where she thought I was going I couldn't move so <laughs> so it took me a while to figure out what she meant so my point is that God's grace uh, thank God uh, got me all through this and he sent others just exactly when I needed them to help me through whatever I was going through and eventually he showed me a way out of the abuse <clears throat> that I experienced and I had a good life afterwards <clears throat> but um, I reflected upon those times often and I prayed and I wanted uh, God to tell me Lord how can I repay you I owe you a big debt a big debt it's got to be something important uh, what can I do so in my prayers uh, God didn't answer me he didn't tell me and then after a lot of praying I happened to remember a verse that I was taught when I was young and, and you all know it it's from songs and it's uh, be still and know that I am God so then I started listening instead of just talking to God I started listening to God and I found out his answer finally and the answer was it's okay you're doing what I want you to do already so and that was just being my brother's keeper helping other people you see I worked in a hospital and part of my job was to inspect the rooms and see if any maintenance was needed and I also did customer satisfaction surveys to see how we can improve uh, our service in the hospital and you know when you go into a room and you talk to somebody especially sick people you don't just walk in and say anything need fix how are we doing no you have to have a conversation with them so I had conversations with many sick people and a lot of times when I would go in the room they would say something like uh, I'm cold I need a blanket could you get me a blanket or I dropped my pen on the floor and I need to fill out this form 
or I can't reach my phone, could you bring it closer? Just a, a whole lot of little, little, little things that I did uh, while I was in the process of doing my job. So one particular event uh, I remember very vividly in my mind, and that was uh, I had previously worked as a nurse's aide in a nursing home. And uh, I knew this one lady, and I we were told that uh, as we come on our shift, we had a review, and they told me that this one lady was uh, not going to make it till the morning. So I did my rounds and checked on them, and I came to her, and I came up to her bed, and she grabbed my hand, looked me in the eye, and said, do you believe in heaven? <laughs> wow. And I said, absolutely, and that's where you're going. So I reassured her. I didn't get back to see her the rest of the night, and by the time I did, she had already gone. But I hope that I was of some comfort to her. Uh, so um, my theory, as far as being your brother's keeper, just do the little things that they are so important to everybody. You know, give them a smile, do something. <laughs> uh, you know, and you don't know how uh, you are going to help them. Uh, so that's my theory. Bloom where you are planted. And uh, I tell you that uh, now uh, I moved here from Kentucky uh, earlier in the year. Uh, I live with my son and my daughter and my son-in-law and we moved here because he, he has family here and his sister has uh, children and she was uh, mentally and physically unable to care for them and eventually they were taken by DHS. So we moved here uh, with the sole purpose of trying to give them a better life and a better home. So, uh, so we're trying to get custody of them right now. So I'd ask you to pray for that. But uh, remember, uh, Bloom where you are planted. Do what you can, and you'll be blessed. Thank you. You did great. Thank you. So God has been gracious with Barb, and uh, she is making a difference. God never answered her question, why or what am I supposed to do, but she's doing the little things and uh, uh, helping her son. Um, we are our brother's keeper because we are all made in the image of God. Uh, when we fail to be our brother's keeper, God is still gracious with us uh, like he was with Cain. Uh, he sent his son to die for our sins. If we admit our sin and admit that he's the son of God and was raised from the dead, he'll come in and forgive our sins and uh, give us life. Uh, if you've never invited Christ into your life, you can do so right now uh, before we close the service. If you've invited your life, uh, Christ into your life, but you find you're, you're falling and, you know, doing some sin over and over again, you can come to him and ask him to forgive you again right now. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, being gracious with us and... Uh, uh, giving us uh, second and many more chances. Uh, you are uh, such a good God. And uh, we thank you for using a Barb, uh, helping her family, her grandkids right now, and uh, uh, serving her, his son and her son. And uh, uh, we uh, uh, pray that you'll continue to use her in important ways and, and help their, uh, them to be, get custody of those uh, children. Uh, we, uh, I, I want to give you an opportunity just to talk to God right now. If you've never committed your life to Christ, you can invite him into your life. Uh, you can thank him for being gracious to you and ask him to help you be your brother's keeper this week. You pray. Thank you, Father, for being a loving, gracious father to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.